I do have a word from God. I really feel like I have a word from God, and I pray that um, we will take just a moment um, for you can pray for me and just ask the Lord to speak to all of us. Could we do that just for a moment in silence? Thank you, Lord. Um, I do teach evangelism, and I am a great commission person. I, I get tickled through the years. When I teach evangelism, we, I don't talk about it. We have to go do street witnessing. <laughs> it just scares college kids to death. So I say to them, all right, we're going to pray, we're going to throw up, and then we're going to go do it. <laughs> There's just no way to do evangelism without doing it. Uh, I enjoy using the uh, two diagnostic questions from Evangelism Explosion, where you ask somebody first, have you come to the place in your spiritual life that you know that you have eternal life? Kind of gets you on the thought about spiritual things. And then you say to them, if you were to die and stand before God and he were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? That's a penetrating thought. I have got some strange answers to that question from Baptist. But the whole point, I think, is the, the way I would answer that question, and then I think the way that the biblical authors would answer that question is a message that's so appropriate to a thanksgiving kind of focus. Now, we've, we, it's been in your songs. The way I think we could answer that question, and if you want to be turning in your Bibles, I'm going to go to Ephesians chapter 2, just one sentence. <laughs> it's ten verses long, but it's one sentence. The thing I'm grateful for, if I had to distill it down, is the un changing, merciful character of the God of creation. The unchanging, merciful character. Uh, if I stand before God and he says, why should I let you in? I'm going to say, because you promised. Because your son died. Because your spirit wooed. You see, the focus is, yeah, you think I'm going to give God a resume? He's probably an Episcopal. <laughs> you think he's impressed where I went to school? Think he's impressed with the churches I've been contacted with? I assure you he's not. What he's impressed about is that he has an eternal redemptive plan that it's working itself out in a fallen, rebellious world. And we, by the grace of God, have been made partakers of that wonderful kingdom. Now, if that don't ring your bell, you got a broke clapper. I mean, of all the blessings we have or don't have, there are many people around the world that can't have a Thanksgiving. I've done so much overseas evangelism, I've met the poorest people in the world and the happiest people in Jesus. And I've met the most miserable people with a big turkey. There's a corollary there, but I will not go there. <laughs> it's the character of God that's our only hope. If God is who he said he is, then we have eternal hope. It comes down to an issue of authority again. Can the Bible be trusted about who God is? Can the Bible be trusted about what he has done for man. That's the issue. That's the really only issue. Now, next Sunday, I, I want to preach on, I want, I want you to think about it now. If I, I'm, I'm, this is a preview, foreshadowing. <laughs> it's homework. If I passed out a three-by-five card and I said, write on this card why you believe the Bible is true, what would you put on that card? That's next Sunday. Hope you'll think about it. This Sunday, I want to talk about Ephesians 2. Now, we've mentioned several times that these early chapters of Ephesians are doctrines that are exactly geared toward people who think they can, people who think they've arrived, people who think they know. And to people who think they know and think they can, Paul gives first the doctrine of predestination, 
Second, the doctrine of grace. And third, the doctrine, there's no more Jew, no more Greek, no more male, no more female. We're all one in Jesus Christ. Now, those are the doctrines of Ephesians. I want to do this, what I think is the definitive passage in the New Testament on the undeserved, unmerited grace of God. If I had, this is one sentence in Greek. This is the only place that Paul writes these long sentences. If I had to try to outline this, I think there is an outline here. Verses 1 through 3 is the hopelessness and helplessness of man apart from God. I'm going to come back now and, and outline that again. In verses 4 through 7 is the undeserved, unmerited grace of the merciful God. And I really think verses 8 through 10... Now, verses 8 and 9, we could almost call the Baptist theme song. I have heard, and I'm sure you have, many, 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 many sermons on Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. But may I say to you that this context goes through verse 10. And the typical Greek way of emphasizing thoughts is to either put it at the beginning out of grammatical order or put it at the end. Verse 10 is always ignored, and it is the chief point in response to the undeserved grace of God, verse 10 is, the, 10 is the appropriate human response. So, you kind of see where I'm going. The you here refers to you Gentiles. The us here refers to Paul and his missionary team, believing Jews. We could widen it to that almost. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Now, I've, I've thought about that a lot. I just love this season. Uh, Peggy and I came into town a little early. We went to your mall. The last time we'll go to the mall over there. Holy moly. <laughs> How do you get to that mall? How do you get out of that mall? I mean, unbelievable traffic jam. But people, they're happy. They're buying. You hear them talk. Brandy would like this. Sarah would like this. Frank would just, you know, it's just the Christmas season. Paul looked across an ancient metropolis and his eyes of spirit-informed gospel truth said, they look alive, they're going to work, they're getting married, they have purposes, they have dreams, they have goals, they're having children, they're raising families. Paul looked to Paul, those huge centers of population in the ancient world, and said, without Christ they're dead. Now, they may be breathing air, their heart may be pumping blood, but spiritually speaking, they're walking dead people. Now, there is the impetus to evangelism. If the gospel is true, and the happy faces we see around us at sporting events or restaurants or malls, if the eye of faith could see that crowd, death and hopelessness and despair would be written across the forehead of numerous of those people that we pass every day. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Only two times in the Bible, once in Ephesians 2, 2 and 3, and once in James 4, are the three enemies of man delineated. I want to note those three enemies, the enemies that all human beings face because of the fall of Genesis 3 the enemies that cloud our judgment, overload our thinking, pervert our understanding. Number one, verse two. In which you formerly walked, now of course walked is a biblical metaphor for lifestyle when it's not literal, it's not literal here, which you walked according to the course of this world. And this is the, this, instead of world, it's the age here. There are two biblical ages, the current evil age and a new age that will be set up by the Messiah. That's the Old Testament pattern. Confusion is there are two comings of the Messiah which overlap those two ages. At some point in the future, I'll talk about that more. But just to say, these are the two ages. I guess as I've thought about this, this is the world system. This is the fallen world system, the consequence of Adam's rebellion. A couple of thoughts here, and they go back in my life to when my children were in junior high school. My youngest one, I can still remember, we used to give them a, a clothing allowance for school. They could have so much money to buy their own clothes. And, uh, my youngest son, Jeremy, came to me and said, uh, Dad, uh, I, I, this is not enough money to buy the blue jeans I want. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, and he mentioned a brand name. 
And those blue jeans cost $60. I said, I am not buying $60 blue jeans. Now, we can go to Walmart and get some really good ones for $14.95. I'm not paying $60. And he said, Dad, if I don't have these blue jeans, I won't be accepted at school. Why do you think that we went to all the children in school wearing the same kind of clothes in our large cities in the northeast of the United States? Is because young people were killing each other over sports jackets and shoes? Do you mean that our culture is so, so bent that we think what we wear is where happiness is found and influence is found and prestige is found in the kind of clothes we wear? I was at home years ago watching this commercial and it was this lady. She was walking by a little stream up in Colorado. The aspens were quaking. Shoot, if you're not happy in Colorado, what's something wrong with you anyway? But this woman's not happy. She's alone. She's sad. So she sprays on aspen cologne. Suddenly, a man on a white horse comes riding off the hill, picks her up. You've got to be a fool to believe that. And we pay $150 an ounce for that perfume. If I just had the right car, I'd be happy. No, you'd be a nerd in a Corvette. That's what you'd be. <laughs> what is the matter with us thinking if I have more or different that I'll be happy? If you're not happy with what you have, nothing and no one can make you happy. It's kind of like marriage counseling. You think getting married is going to make you happy, you're not married. No human being can make another human being happy if that human being is not happy. It can't happen. We have been sold a bill of goods, and that is more is better. That's not true. You and I both know that more often brings more greed. Have you ever met somebody who really is wealthy say, I think I have enough now. To Americans, I want to say, how many square foot house do you have to have to be happy? How many new cars in a garage do you have to have to be happy? How many pair of shoes? I would say how many suits, but I'm a little embarrassed this morning to bring that up at this point. But uh... Western culture has been trapped by materialism, and it is a child of the age of fallenness and cannot bring happiness. The second one is also here, according to the prince of the power of the air of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. This, of course, refers to Satan. Um, I, I was called to preach in 68 in Houston and went to ETBC. And um, my first church was a little bitty church out in the country, of course, where all of us start. And I was preaching one Sunday. I guess I'd used that aspirin cologne because this red wasp thought I was just the, the bomb. And uh, it just kept buzzing me. And the lady stood up and said, It's... Demonic. I said, it's an insect. And I hit it with the hymnal, and that church has saved the, the ceiling tile where I squashed that red wasp above the pulpit. Now, there are two problems here. Everything that happens, the devil did it. That's not true. And the other one is, there is no devil. Now, it just amazes me. It's 15 degrees outside. There are two inches of ice. And Sister Sarah, who is 93 years old, is going to make Sunday school so she won't lose that attendance pin. <laughs> and she slips and breaks her hip right out there, and the devil did it. No, that was just stupid. <laughs> Students come to me and say, I just can't take this test. I'm just sick. I can't take this test. You're sick? I'm sick. Is your girlfriend Sarah? Yes. Doesn't she have mono? Yes. Have you been kissing Sarah? Yes. That's dumb. That ain't the devil. If the girl's nose drips, don't kiss her. That's the spiritual rule. <laughs> That's not, that, not, not very spiritual, but it's true. We make stupid decisions and blame it on Satan. Satan wouldn't be as stupid as to do some of the things we do. I guess what I'm saying is, when you stand before God, the devil made me do it, is not, Flip Wilson will not be there when you get to heaven. <laughs> Did you know, I, I, I was just thinking the other day, Satan is never mentioned in the first eight chapters of Romans. It's not mentioned until 16, which shows that fallenness cannot be blamed on Satan. We sin because we want to. 
Now, the third one is exactly that. And we sometimes call it the Adamic nature, going back to Adam, the fallen nature. It's, it's verse 3. It is not an exact literary parallel. The word according to is not there, but it is a theological parallel. After uh, verse two, 3, the second point is, uh, verse 3, among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of our flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Now here we have this propensity toward self. More and more for me at any cost. This is the essence of sin. This is the problem that all of us face every day. I mean, this morning I woke up and saw my main enemy in the mirror, and it was me. We are addicted to self. If you would let me put it this way, if Genesis 3 is the damage of the image of God that was originally given to allow full fellowship with deity, that's what we're created for, full fellowship, that image was damaged in the fall, would you let me so be so bold as to say that I think salvation is the restoration of that image that allows intimate fellowship with God even now. The essence of salvation is not a ticket to heaven that I get someday in the future. It's not a fire insurance policy for someday in the future. The essence of salvation is an intimate, personal relationship now. It's not only believe, only believe. Eternal life has obvious evidences. Would you buy that? Now, here is the hopelessness and helplessness of man. If I could, if I could do it without being uh, rude, crude, and unattractive, I'd scream right now at verse 4. You talk about a joyous change of context. You talk about from the black pit of human selfishness to the to the heights of the merciful character of God, verse 4 is it. But God, being rich in mercy, remember back in chapter 1 how many times it said, according to the richness of His grace? Remember that, that sermon a few weeks ago? <laughs> I usually tell preachers, if you want to be really humble, just ask your church what you preached on last week. But uh, it is the character of God because of His great love, which He loved us. Now, this is a little technical, but it's not too technical. Look at verse 5 and 6. There are three soon compounds here. Now, soon is just the Greek preposition for with or joint participation with. And you can see it with the ing words here, with and then something. Notice, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. There's the first thing God did. Look at the next one. He raised us up with him. There's the second one, verse 6. Here's the third one. Seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ. Now, this is not what God's going to do in the future. This is not the sweet by and by. This is the radical here and now. This is what's meant to happen to the life of fallen man when they meet Jesus Christ still in a fallen world. Would you notice back in chapter 1, verse 20, I showed it to you last Sunday night when I was here, that what God the Father did for the Son, chapter 1, verse 20, raised him from the dead, seated him in his right hand, God the Son has done for the children in chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. I'm nervous about saying one day we're going to reign with Christ. I'm nervous about that because Paul says we reign now. It's a mental, biblical worldview. It's a perspective on life. It's a who I am based on the authority of Scripture, not the five senses. It's believing that the promises of God are true even when I don't feel them, even when I don't fully understand them, even when they're culturally affected by the way we do religion. I have a biblical worldview that God is good, God is for me, and though I am damaged, he will not let me go. Hallelujah. And anybody who's not damaged, stand up now, and we'll escort you out. Now, verse 7 is a strange verse. I think there are only three places in the whole Bible this is talked about, so I'll show you where they are quickly. Read verse 7 to yourself. 
You say, why are you doing that? To make you bring your Bible. I mean, coming to church without a Bible is just ridiculous. Where is the authority? In some preacher's opinion? You're going to take my word for it? Where is the authority here? Aren't we people of the book? Then let's bring the book. Chapter 3, verse 9. Chapter 2, verse 7. And I've got to look at my notes here. I forgot the other one. 1 Corinthians 4, 9. Now, what are these texts about? This, I'm just going to give you my opinion here, then you've got to think about it. I think that the angels, this is Judaism, of course, have always been jealous of God's special love for man. You know that biblically you are a higher order than angels, right? Because no angel is made in the image of God. Jesus never died for an angel. Angels are never called children. No, no, you're a higher spiritual order. And it always bugged the angels, and the rabbis say that, 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 that the angels tried to stop God from giving the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. Uh, even Peter talks about the angels trying to peek into what God's trying to do. I would submit to you that God's love for damaged, fallen, rebellious human beings is a window for the angelic world to note the character of God. Put it another way. We are trophies of the grace of God for the angelic world to understand God. I want you to look at 2, 7, 3, 9, 1 Corinthians 4, 9. See what you think about that. You have to look at it a little bit and see what you think. So we are trophies to reveal God's mercy to the angelic world. As we are trophies to reveal God's love to other fallen humans, by the way. Now beginning in verse 8 although there's not a textual marker here for a, trans, for a different subject, I think I would say, okay, I have a need. I'm, I'm part of a world affected by original sin, and I'm part of a world affected by personal choices. I'm a sinner because of Adam, and I'm a sinner because I choose to be a sinner. How do I experience the merciful grace of the eternal God? How do I get back in fellowship with the God who created me for fellowship? How do I deal with all this frustration and uncertainty and fear that I am feeling in my life? How do I, how do I buy into that? How do I respond to that? How do I ex receive that? That's the question I think 8 and 9 brings to us. I usually try to get people's attention by saying this. Nobody ever has been or ever can be saved by faith. I want to say that again. No one ever has been or ever can be saved by faith. Faith focuses on the element of the human response. We are not saved by how great or emotional or tearful or joyful the human response is or faithful the key is not the human response. The key is the unchanging character of God. For by grace you have been saved. Now, would you notice that the verb form, and I'm not going to be too picky here, although I think in this church many of you could pick up on the verb forms if I did it. In verse 8, you have been saved. Would you notice back in verse 5 the exact form is earlier? The exact phrase, for by grace you have been saved and continue to be saved. It's a perfect passive paraphrastic verb, which means something happened in the past, results are coming to the present, something I couldn't do, it have to be acted upon. It's paraphrastic, which means it already has occurred. Emphasis. For by grace you have been and continue to be saved, repeated twice for emphasis. Notice the disclaimers about human performance. We're focusing on the character of God, beginning in verse 7. We've seen the horror of the character of man in 1 through 3. Notice the disclaimers. Not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, that anyone should boast. Now, I don't know how Paul can depreciate the human response more than that. There must be a human response. As many as receive him. To them he gave the right to become the children of God, even of those who believed on his name. God so loved the world. Whosoever believeth in him. There is a human response required. 
But the human response is never the focus. The focus is on the God that gives and the gift he gives. I would say that the human response is the hand that receives the gift of God. Boy, that's quite a few disclaimers. And why would that be historically? The Gnostic false teachers and their emphasis on human knowledge, human performance, our group's the only group, our group's the best group. God deliver me from the best Christian group. There's no such thing. If you try to find the perfect church and you join it, you'll screw it up. <laughs> ain't no perfect churches, ain't no perfect denominations. We got to find a group who we feel the major thrust is the same. If somebody asked me, why are you a Baptist? Probably because of my mother, truth were told. But as I've grown up, I'm a Baptist because of their trust and emphasis on the Bible as the Word of God and their emphasis on the Great Commission. I assure you it's not because I'm attracted to we don't spit, dance, or chew, or go with those who do. Now, verse 10, we've always been nervous as Baptists on works. And that's because we're a grace-focused people. But what happened is human work sneaks in the back door. And we meet people who think they're so wonderful because they don't. There sure was a time in my life when I thought the more don'ts you have, the better Christian you are. And I've come to realize the more don'ts you have, the more nobody wants to have lunch with you. Christianity is not the abundance of things you don't do. Christianity is not about you. Christianity is about him, who he is, what he wants. So look at this. Please look at this. For we are his workmanship. You mean these damaged people in 1 through 3 are God's workmanship? You mean these damaged people were created in Christ Jesus for good works? which God prepared beforehand. That's that predestination word from chapter 1, that we should walk. Now, we're walking in sin in verse 2. We walked according to the course of this world. And what God wants is a people who walk according to the course of righteousness. We're not saved by righteousness. Put it this way. We are saved unto good works, not by good works. Let me put it this way. Good works do not lead us to God. But you can't meet God and not be different. Deliver me from Christians who say, oh, I trusted God and live like the devil. God wants a righteous people to reflect his character to a lost world. He's always wanted that. The new covenant doesn't change that focus. It just changes the mechanism for acceptance. The mechanism now is not human performance but grace. But the goal is still... Can I say it to you again? The goal of God for every believer is Christ-likeness now. Not, I come to church three times a year. I don't say damn as much as Fred. I don't eat or drink what they eat or drink. I dress up on Sundays. I have a big Bible that's leather. Those aren't the issues. Let me talk to your spouse. Let me talk to your neighbor. Let me talk to your co-worker. And we'll find out if you're a Christian or not. Now, who you are doesn't get you to God. But how can you claim to meet him and you still be a self-centered turkey? That's the question. Yes, salvation's free. But that's not the focus of the gospel only. It is so hard for me. I am a dialectical theologian. I believe the Bible is Eastern literature. It presents truth in tension-filled pairs. Salvation is absolutely free in the finished work of Jesus Christ plus nothing. Salvation is a cost everything, 24-7, dynamic relationship with him once you accept it. And there's no way to pull that coin apart. And what we've got is denominations that focus on this, and Baptists are one of them. 
And we've got people on the rolls of this church that the Holy Spirit can't find. Best churches in America run 42% on the best Sunday of, of the year. Others focus on this. And they're, they're, they're mad if you, if you play bingo. They're, they're mad if you drop your Bible. They're mad if you come to shir- church without a suit. You know, it's, There's two ditches here. Two ditches. But the truth is, it's absolutely free. And it costs everything. And you're required to live in that tension as you serve him and love him every day. My fear is that church has turned into a parking lot we go to once a week instead of a dynamic relationship that everybody we know sees and understands. May we pray? God, have mercy on us for playing church. God, have mercy on us for our judgmentalism and our legalism. And God, give us a gentle, sweet Christian spirit that voluntarily gives up the things of materialism and the things of self to serve you and know you, that people will know that we've been with you. God, have mercy for playing these games of separating our life into sacred and secular or into which day of the week it is to depend on how we act or how we talk. God, have mercy for us for our laziness and selfishness of American Christianity. Lord, may your spirit have freedom today. Only your spirit can bring the truth. Only your spirit can shine the light of biblical revelation in the heart of people you love and created. And we pray that you would have the freedom to do that. We know there are people here who need you. They need you because they're saved and they've gotten away and they need you because they've never been saved. We know they're here. And no human sermon, no emphasis, no song, no, no method can draw them unless your spirit has mercy on them and speaks to their heart. Speak to their heart now, Lord, about their need for you. Forgive us for all the excuses and things that we put in place of a true relationship. Forgive us for religiosity and denominational arrogance. Forgive us for selfish lives and yet claiming to know you. Lord, we pray you would fill us and energize us to be the people of God in our day. We ask for mercy on our selfishness. In Jesus' name, amen.